Hey, how y'all doing? Doing fine. Good. All right. We're getting ready to go on Facebook Live, y'all. All right. Good morning. Good morning, people who are in Facebook land. We are the Beloved Community Church, where myself, Reverend Dr. Sherry Moloch, and my better half, Guy Moloch Jr., Reverend Guy Moloch Jr., is the other pastor. Is Pastor Guy, you want to say anything? Welcome, everybody, to the Beloved Community Church. We hope you enjoy the, your worship experience today. Amen. So let's go ahead and get started. So as I said again, early greetings, everybody. Today is the first week of May, the first Sunday in May, May 1st. And so we are so happy to be out of April with all of the pollen. Hopefully it'll start to die down a little bit so some of us can breathe, amen. And so we always want to start, first of all, talking about our theme for the year, which is refocused, reframed, renewed from Isaiah 40, 31. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not. And that is the new revised standard updated edition. Amen. I ask everybody to please mute themselves. Amen. And then we always start with our vision statement. If we could say it together. We are an open and affirming Christian community that is committed to sharing the unconditional love of Christ by serving others with compassion, integrity, moral courage, divine discipline, and what? Intelligent faith. That's our favorite part. Amen. Amen. So we hope that uh, you all will join in, in with us. I will go ahead and Pastor God, if you could read the dark print, and then we will respond with the white print. Amen. 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 Gracious and compassionate creator, we're gathered to worship you. You are great and worthy of all praise. We quiet our hearts and minds so that we may hear and respond to your voice. You are great and worthy of all praise. Christ of our hearts, be enlivened in and among us. You are great and worthy of all praise. Live through us as doers of justice, lovers of mercy, and as those who walk humbly with you. You are great and worthy of all praise. This, to, so that we may become the beloved community where all may live with dignity and peace. Because you are great and worthy of all praise. Amen. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. Yay. All right, now it's time for our praise and worship. Amen. This is beloved praise singing, the blood still works.
All right, beloved. Yes, we all know the blood still works. I know the blood still works. Oh, yes, the blood still works. Amen. We are lo I love that song. I play it. I don't know if y'all notice every communion, every first Sunday, I play that song. The blood still works. Now it's time for our staying connected with our testimonies. Does anyone have a testimony they would like to share this morning? Pastor Guy? Yes, I have one. Uh, yesterday, uh, uh, Friday, Pastor Sherry and I left and went to Wilmington, Delaware. And on Saturday, we, we participated in the unveiling of a statue of the first African-American mayor of Wilmington, Delaware. His name is, is James Sills uh, Jr. He was mayor of Wilmington starting in 1992, and he served for two four-year terms. Uh, later on in the 2000s, my brother, my little brother, happened to marry into the family, and he married uh, a former mayor, James Sills' daughter. And so we actually married into the family. But it was a wonderful, wonderful uh, occasion. Uh, they already had named a bridge after him in the east side of the city at the Brandywine Park. And right in the, at the entrance of the park, they did an unveiling of this life-size, uh, uh, not a life-size, but a much larger than life-size, full-length full statue. A lot of politicians were there. Someone spoke on behalf of uh, uh, President Biden. Some senators were there, Congress people, all kinds of people were there. He's 91 years old now. And what a blessing it was for him to be able to experience that while he is still alive, has sound mind, and is still kicking. So it was just a wonderful, a wonderful affair, a wonderful occasion. We had the opportunity to, to honor someone who, who was given 60 years of public service. So I just wanted to bring that uh, to your hearing because we're just so proud and honored to be a part of such a wonderful occasion. Amen. It was wonderful. As Pastor Guy said, we also got to spend a little time with family. Guy's mom was there, 88 years young, still also alive. And as Pastor Guy said, kicking. And we got to spend time with my brother and sister-in-law and their kids as well. So it was a good time to be had by all. Amen. Amen. Anybody else want to share a testimony before we move on? We all good? Okie dokie. Well, we got a few new pictures this week. Pastor, that's me and Pastor Guy at the at the uh, service that we just talked about yesterday with our cool shades on, amen. I think, uh, let me see, who else has a new picture on here this week? Uh, I don't know, this isn't new, but I love this picture. These are the pictures of Calvin and his lovely bride, Reverend Carl and Pam and Lumumba. And a jeweled, Alisa's daughter um, pledged, amen. Um, I forgot who she pledged with, oh no. But I think it's, I think it's I'm not gonna say because then I'll mess it up. But she pledged with somebody <laughs> and crossed over. At it's Sigma City. Gamma, Sigma Gamma Rho. Thank you. And so that's a picture of Jewel. Um, see, we have, uh, this is not a new picture, but I just like this picture. So I put it up with Lamumba and Tina. Um, sometimes when y'all send me multiple pictures, y'all know I can only pull up one picture at a time, right? <laughs> so I save them and put them up later on, amen. And we also want to talk about uh, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And so Dr. Laura and I are going to switch, we're going to team hit, switch off, uh, or tag team. I'm um, talking about a mental health moment every Sunday this month. And today I'm going to kick it off with um, talking about mental health awareness. We want to, because what, when we know more, we can break the silence. When we break the silence, then we can break the stigma. And so, as it says at the bottom of this um, slide, not all pain is physical and not all wounds are visible, amen? And so we want people to be free and part of freedom is awareness. And then once you're aware, you can break the stigma and then you can also get treatment. And so this month, we're probably gonna focus on um, anxiety and trauma, amen? And so today I'm gonna talk about trauma, anxiety disorders, and so I wanted to just give a really brief overview. Anxiety, is tr anxiety disorders are tricky. And one of the reasons why they're tricky is because anxiety is a normal response that we have to stressful life situations. So it's not uncommon for you. Maybe you're a little bit nervous before you speak in front of a large crowd, or you may um, be in a situation that's unfamiliar to you and you feel a little bit uncomfortable. Pastor Guy and I were talking yesterday as we were driving to... Uh, Wilmington, that as we get older, we notice that we get more anxious about things, and we were talking about that, and we were saying how at one point in our lives, we would cross the Bay Bridge and not think about it. Now we're a little bit, you know, we still cross it, but we're a little bit anxious doing that. So that's kind of a normal response to 
to something that's potentially stressful. But when those feelings become excessive, they become all consuming. And very importantly, when they interfere with daily functioning, okay, then we say you have an anxiety disorder. Now, sometimes you might not think it's interfering with your daily functioning, but if you find yourself altering your routine or what you do because you are anticipating or afraid of having an anxiety experience, then that's considered to be interfering with daily functioning. So for those of you who example, who don't like to fly, if you find yourself driving long distances or going by train, when, particularly if you have a function you need to go to and you need to get there relatively quickly and you feel super anxious about getting on the plane and you may even have to take medication to get on the plane, then that's considered to be a disorder, amen? Anxiety disorders are pretty common. About 30% of all adults will be affected by an anxiety disorder in their lifetime. But the good news, and Dr. Laura and I are going to talk a lot about, of all the mental health challenges that you can have, anxiety is the most treatable, <laughs> okay? There are lots of therapeutic techniques and medications that are very helpful. And we'll be talking about that in subsequent Sundays. Um, the type, these are just different types of anxiety disorders. Simple phobia is the most common. Those are things like you're afraid of spiders, we have a Diara's like that. Diara, if she sees a spider in her room, screams like it's someone's murdering her, amen. And so um, that's a pretty common one. Some folks are afraid of dogs. Um, I said flying. Some people are afraid of water. Some people are afraid of, I have dental phobia. I'm afraid to death of the dentist and I avoid it and to my detriment. So dental, dental being afraid of the dentist is very common. Heights is very common. Being in an enclosed place, those are very common phobias and those are very treatable. Generalized anxiety is a little more diffuse, kind of an underlying uneasiness that stays with you a lot. Panic disorders, most of you know what a panic attack is. We'll talk about that later. But a panic disorder is when you have recurring panic attacks, amen? And then social anxiety disorders, you feel uncomfortable in some kinds of uh, particularly unfamiliar social situations. So you might be fine with your small group of friends and family, but speaking in public, having to eat, sometimes even eat in public or you're concerned that you might do something that might be embarrassing. Agoraphobia is people who are afraid of what's called open spaces. And it's, it depends on the person. Sometimes it's a particular type of space, like the grocery store or the pharmacy or a mall. For some people, it's like basically almost everything. Obsessive compulsive disorders, when people have intrusive obsessive thoughts and they have compulsions or ritualistic behavior that they engage in to combat the anxiety about the thoughts, okay? So this could be hand watching. Some people do counting. Some people have to count a certain number of times before they'll enter a room. Then they may have other things that they have to do. We'll talk about that. And then separation anxiety disorder is what occurs in children who are afraid to be apart from their parents. And um, they're afraid that something bad will happen to their parents. And normally, believe it or not, this is considered to be kind of a psychiatric emergency because you don't want children to get into the habit of not going to school or not being apart from their parents. And once you reinforce that behavior, it becomes more difficult to change it. So we'll be talking about all of these and trauma, amen, in the subsequent weeks. So tell your loved ones to tune in. This is free advice and free information. And, um, and we'll make it as compact as we can. But we want everyone to have mentally healthy lives, right? We want everyone to have mental well-being. And the first step to that is to have knowledge. When you have knowledge, knowledge is powerful. It makes you more aware of what's going on. Yes, Jody. Unmute. Okay. Um, uh, I feel terrible about the young children, like at the border, and the young children in Ukraine, and everything. Who they have must have terrible anxiety disorders when you can't find your parent and all those kinds of things. It's, yes, it's they very have. Upsetting they and we have to pray for all of them. I agree. We also need to keep in mind that when we talk about trauma, we'll talk about that, that some of the things that they are experiencing are traumatic. So it's in addition to the um, anxiety probably is a result of the trauma. Amen. But thank you for bringing that up. Okay. So remember each week we talk about the hotline, right? And um, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, 1-800-273-8255, or that um, last part spells suicide. We know for the LGBTQ community, you can call one 866 488-7386. There's a trans hotline. If you don't feel like talking to a person, you feel more comfortable communicating via text, you can text START to 741741. Please take a picture of this. 
um, have it in your phone, have it by your bedside. If you want, you can um, print it out amen, so that you have it, always have it available. It's in my phone because you never know when someone's going to be in crisis and you don't want to be fiddling trying to find the phone number. Amen. But the easiest thing for the suicide prevention is remember 1-800-SUICIDE. 1-800-SUICIDE. Those numbers spell out suicide. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to have our prayer of consolation and petition. And so this is a prayer that we do each week to kind of hone in on what are the things that we want to ask God for to grant us in terms of blessings or to pray on someone's behalf. So if we could all bow our heads and close our eyes and assume a posture of prayer. Dear gracious and merciful God, first and foremost, we come to you to say thank you. God, we thank you that you are God and you are sitting high, but always look low. You are the God who can count all of the hairs on our heads. You are the God who is concerned about our mental and physical and spiritual well-being. You are the God who even in the midst of chaos could create something out of nothing. You are the God who loves with an everlasting love. You are a God who looks beyond our faults and sees our needs, looks beyond our flaws and sees possibilities. You are the everlasting God. You are the God who would thought it not robbery to give up your only begotten son so that we might have access to the tree of life. And that tree is you. So God, we thank you for who you are and all that you do. God, we ask right now that you visit every home under the sound of my voice and whatever people stand in need of, God, we ask that you grant it right now in the name of Jesus. If it's a health concern, if there's a concern about our eyes and our eyesight, God, if there's a concern about our hearts, if there's a concern about diabetes, if there's a concern about PTSD, if there's a concern about being exposed to traumatic events, if it's a concern about um, neuropathy, if there's a concern about headaches, God, if there's a concern about stress, whatever the concern is about God, we ask that you grant us not just the removal of the source of the stress, but in the meantime, in between time, while we are waiting for the blessing to be manifested on this side of Zion, we ask that you give us the peace that transcends and surpasses all of our understanding. That means that while we are waiting for the blessing, we don't get anxious and we don't worry and we don't fret because we know you've got it. The same God that can create the universe can certainly handle our problems. God, help us to lean and depend solely on you and not be caught off guard that what things look like but what, how we know they really are because you are in charge. And then God, we ask that you go by and visit the people who are you in Ukraine, God, who are suffering from the casualties of war and the trauma that often ensues because of that. God, we ask right now that you soften the hearts of leaders who are, are bent and focused only on destruction. We ask that you help all of the leaders around the world make wise decisions on how to handle and manage the situation in Ukraine. God, we ask right now that you continue to be the God who is the one who is the healer in the sick room, God, for people who are going through COVID, and sometimes people are long haulers and going through subsequent symptoms and challenges because of COVID. Help us to all keep an open mind about vaccines and boosters, God. Help us to follow the science and not the rhetoric. Help us to be um, ever mindful, God, that we don't get vaccinated just for ourselves, but for our neighbors, because you call for us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And we are to love ourselves and our neighbors the way you love us. God, last but not least, we ask that you bless this service, that you bless the beloved community to help us to continue to do all that we are supposed to do and be all that we are supposed to be, God, so that we can be your ambassadors. These and all other blessings we ask us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, BCC announcement. We got birthdays, lots of May birthdays. Let's give a hand clap of praise for all the May babies, amen? So we got tomorrow, Tony Green, yay. Tuesday is Margaret and Valerie Pride. Miss Leola is at the end of the week on the 5th, amen? And then next week, we got Jackie Pigford and Jamar Pride, Valerie and my son. And today is Tony and Keisha's wedding anniversary. Amen. Congratulations. 
And I'm so glad to see they thought on that robbery that even though it's their anniversary, they're here in the service, amen? And so we're glad that we're able to congratulate you and celebrate with you. If I have forgotten your anniversary or your uh, birthday, please shoot me an email. You can even put it in the, in the chat feature right now. And that way we don't want to miss out on anybody's celebration, amen? Our Bible study is going to be on May 5th. I believe we'll be wrapping up the Galatians. Um, yep, I think this week is the last week, okay. So this week is the last week for Galatians. And I believe, um, I think I'm going to do a thing on mental health, amen, because it's mental health month and we need to get right with our health, our mental health, amen. I have noticed and Dr. Laura and Dr. Debbie and I have been talking quite a bit offline about all the stress that people are experiencing. I was, as you all know, I was in New York last week to kick off the launch for uh, the suicide prevention program I developed called Haven, helping alleviate Valley experiences now. Uh, it's called Haven Connect. And uh, we are in the middle of training members of the church to work with youth for suicide prevention. We've had some training sessions and we'll continue to do that. And our first launch for youth is on May 11th. We have three sessions for them. And so there's a lot going on with our young people. And one of the things I think that we've all maybe forgotten is that our young people during COVID have basically not been in church, right? Because they find this format we have kind of boring. <laughs> and, then, and so while we used to do things with youth and we, most youth ministries, kids do things out in the community and they're really actively engaged, but because of COVID they had to shut down. So it's not just BCC, every church I know we're really concerned about the youth because the church has not been able to be as active with them because youth ministries tend to center around activities. So that's something that we need to think about as well because most of our youth have grown up and really we need to bring more youth into the church. And so one of the things we need to be working on actively is how can we engage youth? And they don't have to be members of our church. There are other ways that we can do that, amen. And so we're gonna talk about mental health challenges and how we can, not just challenges and because we tend to focus as black folks on crisis prevention and intervention. We want to prevent the crisis from ever occurring. That's what my program does. It prevents it from even happening. And so we wanna make sure that we, get, we talk about that, uh, not just in the month of May, but definitely have a several sessions on that. And then, and then we have, speaking of stress, we have stress management, not this week, but the following week. We had a stress management class last week, it was great. Uh, we did a relaxations training. We talked some more about stresses associated with COVID actually. And one of the things I love about BCC, while we're a small church, we're a really well represented church. We have people from all walks of life. And so Ms. Leola keeps us really up to date on what's going on in school systems and the public schools and the stress that's associated with that. And I think sometimes it's good for y'all to come to that class and just hear what other people are going through to realize one, you're not alone, but two, Folks have different challenges than you. And so it kind of humbles you and helps you to put your own stuff in perspective, amen? And so please come out for stress management, invite friends and colleagues on May 10th at 7 p.m. And then we had a good time at book club. We didn't have that many people there, but we read the book, Don't Cry For Me. And our new book, which was suggested by Aunt Margaret is The Personal Librarian, amen? The New York Times bestseller. And that's, we're gonna be reading that for May 12th. Now y'all are, Y'all are um, kind of dropping out of a uh, book club again. So I know y'all don't want to disappoint Reverend Paula and Samaris, right? So if you don't want to disappoint the Reverend Halls, the Reverend's Halls, <laughs> then y'all need to come on, okay? Man? And don't tell me you ain't got time to read it. I'm bivocational and have a research study going on in another state and I'm reading my book. So I don't want to hear about you don't have no time. And then you can do like Reverend Samaris and Pastor Guy, they listen to the audio book. You can do that in your car, man. I, I, they got me doing it. And I'm not an audio person, I'm more a visual person, but I do find that when I'm in the car, I just put the book on and that way I get half the book read just sitting in the car, man. So do that or put, play the book. I know Reverend Paula listens to the books when she's exercising and working out. You can do it then. So I do not want to hear any more about, um, you, you don't have no time to read the book. And I don't want to hear about, can't we do it once a month, Pastor Sherry? Because even if we did it once a month, you ain't going to start reading the book till the week before anyway. So it really doesn't matter. <laughs> and then, so I see Reverend Hall laughing and he goes, yeah, I'm taking y'all all to the woodshed about this book club. <laughs> and so and this is a good opportunity. One of the things we talk about in our suicide prevention program is the importance of balance. Amen. The, and in fact, I think my next sermon is going to be about balance. 
you, as hard as you work and as much as you have to do, you have to learn to play every day. Now, maybe you're like Chief and you sit in your, on your patio and smoke a cigar. And I ain't gonna say what else he's doing out there, but he smokes too. Okay, he smokes too because of cigars, amen. And I've already lectured him about the cigar smoking, so I'm gonna just leave that alone, let the Lord work that out, <laughs> amen. Um, or you can take a hot bath or you can read a book. Or you, I play games on my phone. I, my pastor guy laughs at me. I never sit still because if I have an unexpected pause in my day, I'm either reading or, um, or doing something or a game or something. And I intentionally do not do work-related reading. So when I tell you all I'm reading, I'm talking about fun. I'm not talking about what I read for work. I know Dr. Laura and I have to read a lot just to create a, a syllabus for a class. So we're not talking about that. But it's important to have balance because that's how you, one of the ways you can reduce stress, amen? And so regardless of how busy you are, what you have to do, you got to make time for yourself. So this is one of the ways that BCC is encouraging you to do that. So I want to see 20 people at book club. That's what I'm saying. All right, that's what I'm saying. So don't let me have to call you personally and ask you to read this book, amen? Amen, all right. Our, this is our what, 14th anniversary month. God is good, amen. We will be celebrating our 14th anniversary, church anniversary on May 22nd, 2022, at 1130 a.m. And we are really gonna be in for a special treat as our guest speaker is Reverend Dr. Aaron Wade, who is the founding pastor of the Community Church of Washington, D.C., UCC. Since its inception, the, uni the Community Church of Washington has been an ardent supporter of BCC, a phenomenal supporter of BCC. Uh, Pastor Don and I have preached at this church. We have met with them. We have done things together in the events in the community. Um, pastor Wade is going to be retiring as pastor of Community Church, I believe the week before our anniversary. And so he actually made room in his schedule to preach at our anniversary around his own celebration of his retirement. So we don't want to have like 10, 20 people at this service, y'all. We want to pack this out, amen? Also, I'm not to make you feel sad, but this is the second to last anniversary that Pastor Guy and I will be at, amen? And so we don't want, we want to culminate all of our experiences. There is a, um, a link to the, um, the service. You do have to register. And so we'll make that available to you. Um, Reverend Paula, as always, has done an excellent job on creating the, the flyer. So let's give her a hand clap of praise, amen. And so, um, and she did that on her sick bed, amen. So we really want you to know, Reverend Paula, we really appreciate you. And so please register because particularly for events like this to make sure we don't have Zoom bombers, we, you must register. Even if you're a regular member of BCC, you have to register, including me. So everybody needs to register in order to get in. Click on the link. You can go to our Facebook page and see it there and click on the link. And for those of you who go, I can't get it to work. All you gotta do is copy it and then clip it into your URL bar and then go to it that way, amen? Okay, so please, please let everybody know. We wanna pack this out, amen? Oh, Thursdays in Black. So we have Thursdays in Black where we talk about bringing awareness and attention to domestic violence globally. We send in pictures every week with us dressed in black. Uh, this week, Reverend Dr. Debbie is always um, has a picture with beautiful jewelry. I want that necklace, Dr. Day, I'm just saying. Right, Reverend Paula sent a new picture. Chief Hall always sends in a new picture as well. I think this is a new picture of Tina as well. Reverend Barbara always sends in a picture. Reverend Carl was at a costume party for his sister-in-law, amen? So he was like, power to the people. <laughs> yeah, so and he had on the costume. So we thank you, Reverend Carl, for you bringing in your costume and a little bit of levity. Uh, on this page, we have Reverend Holly's picture is new, and Dr. Laura sent in another picture of her students, who are mostly in some form or fashion in Black, amen. And you can do that too, right? You can ask people, your colleagues or your office mates, to wear Black on a Thursday and get together and do a group picture. You know, we have our Burning Bush Bible study group over there. Uh, we got Leola sending in a new picture, Reverend Dr. Debbie's friends. There's Zaya, who's growing up so much, and uh, there's Na a Naima, there's our grandbaby. Uh, Michaela's group is in Virginia Beach right now at the cheerleading competition and her team came in first. So I wanna give her a hand clap of praise. She's very excited. Last week, two weeks ago, they uh, messed up their routine. They were going into first and fell to fourth and they were absolutely devastated. 
So this is a comeback for them, amen. On this page, we have friends. We got Aunt Margaret, we got Trey, we got Victoria and friends of Dr. Deb. Dr. Deb, we're gonna send her in a special award because she sends in more pictures from friends than anybody else. There's me with my allergy eyes. And then I was gonna not put this picture up. I was like, you know what? That's how I looked that day, <laughs> amen. So it's all good. Reverend Guy has in the new picture, and this is one of uh, Dr. Debs' colleagues. And this is Pastor Guy's um, senior staff at where he works at, amen. So we want you to continue to bring in those pictures. And I know you're thinking, I'll just send in the same old picture, but remember, I have all the pictures. So I know when you do that, amen, <laughs> when you send in an old picture, send in a new picture, why? It might be the same outfit. I sometimes have the same couple of t-shirts. That's not really the point. The point is to honor the struggle of the young men and women who have to go through this. And to me, if I can't spend five minutes putting on a black t-shirt or shirt and taking a picture to bring awareness to them with all that they struggle through, that's just a really small sacrifice to make, amen. Wanna to continue to um, applaud, commend, and pray for the succession committee, which is made up of seven lay members for the, the um, transition for Pastor Guy and I, because y'all, you know, we're in May now, it's a year away. It's a year away, man. So we want to continue to lift them up in prayer. And now we have, is there a doctor in the house? Good morning. There is. Um, and so again, we talk about COVID. Um, the, hmm, I don't know what kind of news it is. So we are continuing to see a increase in the number of Omicron variant infections. Um, Prince George's County had up over a thousand new cases in this past week. I only know because we presented it at one of our hospitals that the numbers were going up. Um, DC numbers are up a little bit, but they're still less than 600 um, per day. Maryland overall is up um, now up to about 6,600 and Virginia continues to lead the way with 10,000 um, cases. What we do know is that there is undercounting of the number of positive cases because the home tests are not often reported. And so we know that there are others that actually have infection. What's concerning for me is the number of children who are COVID positive in this past week jumped to by 37,000. That's quite a bit. We haven't had that big of increase um, since January. So we're a little bit concerned about that. Um, and then what we're starting to see, which is always the case, that the hospitalizations lag behind the initial infections. Although most people who are vaccinated and up to date on their boosters have experienced COVID for about five days to seven days, maybe some symptoms, and usually they're better. But our unvaccinated um, brothers and sisters are the ones who are beginning to manifest a little bit more serious illness and they're starting to be um, hospitalized. So far, the number of patients going into our intensive care unit in our area is not significantly increased. Across our country, the cases of positivity have doubled in the last week. Um, so we're all just a, a tad bit concerned with people still continuing to sort of roll back protection. So for us, we will continue to wear our masks, wash our hands and distance. And although the weather is wonderful and we want to gather, the places that are still super spreaders are those bars, those um, activities where, where people are coming together, eating and drinking. This Omicron variant is very, very contagious. So it doesn't take very long for you to contract it. Um, and there's still RSV and rhinovirus in the community, which sort of gives you a cold, maybe wheezing and some vomiting and diarrhea. If your kids are sick, please stay away from them. Okay, you can't stay away from them, but be careful because they are up playing again in a day or two and we are out. So 
stay distance, wash your hands, and wear your mask. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Dr. Deb. Let's give her a hand clap of praise, amen, for her faithful ministry, amen, and for her dedication, for just being a good person, amen, how about that, <laughs> amen, amen. Let me put up the slides again. It's time to give, Reverend Samaras. You Read just it. stepped out, but I can handle it, Pastor Sherry. Okay, you handle it. Excellent. BCC. Okay, you also have to give Debbie, uh, Reverend Debbie, a hand clap of praise because she just looks good. Yay! <laughs> okay. BCC, so you know that as we continue our work, the stuff that we're trying to do for each other as a community and for outside our community, we have to continue to give our tithes and offerings. Thank you so much for continuing to do that through the entire pandemic. BCC has been faithful and we are so glad that you are. So. There are ways for you to be able to continue to contribute and to give. One, of course, is to go to our website and to click on the giving button that's there. It's a link that will open uh, PayPal and allow you to make your offering there. If you don't want to go through the website, you can go directly to PayPal and put in the BCC web uh, e email address, belovedcommunity.church at yahoo.com. And that will allow you to directly be able to give your tithe and offering in and PayPal. Of course, you can always go and write a check or money order. Don't put cash in the envelope and put it in an envelope and send it to P.O. Box 441439 in Fort Washington, Maryland, 20749. Your contributions to this ministry are always appreciated. And, you know, Ms. Pam puts out reports for us when we have our church meetings where you can see where every single dime that you give, where it goes to and how we're using it to further the kingdom. So you don't have to worry about us misusing the funds. The pastors don't drive a Rolls. They don't have a uh, helicopter and they don't have their own jet. Uh, so <laughs> they're driving just regular cars, just like me and you and get that. Yeah, since that's, if, you, if you want to give that, no, if you want to give, <laughs> you want to give us a helicopter or a plane, we want it. <laughs> but in the meantime, so we can continue our ministry work, just give your tithes and offerings in the way we've already discussed. And I know you guys are going to be blessed. Thank you so much, BCC. Let's pray. And then Pastor Sherry is going to put on some music. Lord, we love you. We honor you. We thank you for all you continue to do for us. Lord, receive this offering and use it. Use it for the kingdom, God, so that we can further the work that you have for us to do. Thank you, God. We love you and we honor you. It's in the name of Jesus we are compelled to pray. Amen. Amen.
our King by Reverend Samars Hall in the lead. Amen. Let's give a hand clap of praise for glory to our King and a hand clap of praise for our speaker of the hour, Reverend Guy Moloch Jr. Amen. Our scripture today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29 to 35 in the NRSV updated edition, and it reads as follows. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wise be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as if they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possession and those who deal with the world as if they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxiety. The unmarried man is anxious about the affairs of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about the prayers of the world, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried woman and the virgin are anxious about the affairs of the Lord, so that they may be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about the affairs of the world, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to put any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and unhindered devotion to the Lord. May the Lord add a, a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and most importantly, those of us who are willing to allow this word to marinate in our spirits, transform us on the inside so that we can be transformers in our communities on the outside. Amen. So after this demonic selection, the next voice you will hear is our very own pastor and guy. Hear you him and truly be blessed. You thought I was worth
praise amen 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 thank you beloved praise uh for that wonderful sermonic selection uh led by our own brother aaron hall amen that god thought that we were saving so much that god died for us we learned that a couple of weeks ago during our easter service sunday that god died for us so that we can be set free what a wonderful thing we thank you jesus today for for setting us free so, so we may have a brand new life uh, welcome, a beloved community, uh, to this worship service today. We're just so happy and honored that you decided to come to the beloved community church today to worship with us collectively as we hear what words that God has revealed to me, God's servant, to reveal to you so that we can live our lives exceedingly abundantly um, within the confines of the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I'm just so happy to be here today. Amen. I want to thank Pastor uh, Sherry for reading the scripture uh, today that comes from 1 Corinthians, uh, Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29 through 35. Uh, she read it from the New Revised Standard Updated Division edition. I do want to read it to you one more time in your hearing, but this time it's going to be the translation is coming from the message translation. So again, from the message translation, 1 Corinthians 7, uh, verses 29. Through 35. And the scripture reads as follows. I do, I do want to point out, friends, the time is of the essence. There is no time to waste. So don't complicate your lives unnecessarily. Keep it simple. In marriage, grief, joy, whatever, even in ordinary things, your daily routines of shopping and so on. Deal as sparingly as possible with the things the world thrust on you. This world, as you see, is fading away. I want you to live as free of complications as possible. When you are married, you're free to concentrate on simply pleasing the master. Marriage involves you in all the nuts and bolts of domestic life and in wanting to please your spouse, leading to so many more demands on your attention. The time and energy that married people spend on caring for and nurturing each other, the unmarried can spend becoming whole and holy instruments of God. I'm trying to be helpful and make it as easy as possible for you, not make things harder. All I want is for you to be able to develop a way of life in which you can spend plenty of time together with the master without a lot of distractions. I want you to be able to spend plenty of time together with the master without a lot of distractions. Pray with me as we consider the sermon topic. Caught up in distractions, a million little things. Caught up in distractions, a million little things. Almighty God, creator of all things, we pray that you will open the mouth of your servant to proclaim your word and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we pray that the same spirit will open the hearts of his hearers assembled here today to receive your holy gospel and write it on their hearts, your holy commandments of love, just as you have promised. I pray this prayer in your son's name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Caught up in distractions, a million little things. Stunning new evidence recently released by, uh, to a House of Representatives subcommittee reveals that Jenny Thomas, the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, played a deep and disturbing role in the deadly conspiracy to overturn the 2020 presidential election. Text messages show that Jenny Thomas, who is long known to have close connections and is an avid supporter of white supremacist organizations, 
was in close contact with Trump's chief of staff, Martin Meadows, throughout the post-election period, urging Meadows not to let Trump concede the 2020 election, asserting without, vol uh, without evidence election fraud, and expressing, and expressing frustration that Republican members of Congress were not doing more to help overturn the results. This from the wife of a Supreme Court justice, a, a justice that is part of an institution that is supposed to be nonpartisan and of the highest integrity and moral ethics. As a result of Jenny Thomas's actions, House Democrats urged Justice Thomas to recuse himself from hearing, hearing any more cases involved in the 2020 presidential election, including the January 6, 2021 riotous insurrection at the United States Capitol. Do you hear me today? Justice Thomas, of course, refused. He refused to recuse himself. And get this, Clarence Thomas was the sole Supreme Court justice to dissent in Trump's doomed effort to keep relevant documents from being released to the committee. But Thomas gave no reason why he dissented. Now, we surely know why. You see the ethical and moral conflicts at play here are glaring, beloved. In my own personal view, Clarence Thomas's presence on the Supreme Court has always been a blight on its integrity, given his sexual harassment of Professor Hill nearly 30 years ago. But now he represents a pulsating tumor of sedition and corruption that has a wide reaching impact on the citizens of this country. You see, over the last month, while the world has been wildly distracted by being fixated on the slap involving Will Smith and Chris Rock, that slap only negatively affected one person in Chris Rock. However, because Clarence Thomas sits on the highest court in the land and has lifetime tenure, his judicial decisions will continue to have the effect of slapping not just one person, but millions of people, particularly black and brown people, in ways that will keep us in a continuous cycle of bondage in various aspects of our lives, including women's reproductive rights, universal health care, voter suppression, mass incarceration, gun control, LGBTQ plus rights, economic and environmental injustice, climate change, systemic racism, and an unjust criminal justice system. Ah, uh, we better wake up, beloved, and stop letting a million little insignificant things like the slap distract us from the much more life-altering, impactful things of life that has had and will continue to have a major disastrous effect on our lives for generations to come. Clarence and Jenny Thomas, not Will and Chris, really should be the slap heard around the world. And I get an amen. Speaking of distractions. Amen. Speaking of distractions, we all know that teenagers are notorious for being distracted drivers. That's why the state of Maryland has a graduated license law. When you have your provisional license, you cannot have more than one other person in the car with you, and that person is supposed to be related to you, preferably a parent. Statistics show that the biggest factor in teenage accidents is the number of other teenagers in the car because they become distracted by all the things going on in the car by their friends. However, teenagers, they're not the only ones who are driving while distracted. I call it DWD. Adults could be some of the biggest offenders of driving while distracted. There's been a lot of news over the recent years about distractions by virtue of legislation uh, that ban cell phones while driving. Uh, you know, we talked and we text, which has led to dire and deadly consequences on the roads. Cell phones aren't the only culprit. Uh, you know, we have loud music and we have eating while driving. That can be dangerous, as well as putting makeup on while driving and, and simply doing everything else while driving, and focusing on the main task of driving safely. Caught up in distractions while doing a million little things. Beloved, it's hard to remain focused in the world we are living today. We're always on the move, but going nowhere fast. 
We're like hamsters on a wheel, constantly going around and around and around and getting nowhere. The distractions of, of life dictate our decisions and control our schedules. Uh, we make a lot of plans, but get very little done. The phone rings, we, we need something at the store. We want to check our email or maybe our text message, our cell phones, our tablets, et cetera. We get caught on the web of the internet following a story, looking something up, blogging, listening to podcasts, checking the weather, looking to see if your favorite sports team is winning, or just catching up on the news. The kids need to be dropped off, and then they need to be picked up. The car broke down again and needs to be repaired. Homework needs to be done. A stack of books are begging to be read. The lawn needs to be tended to. Even making lists of things that need to be done can be a distraction. You know, the thing about it is that it all seems so important at the time, or at least necessary. But was it really? Hmm. Church, our lives are filled with the urgent, the here and now. And at times, it seems we have no time for God, the eternal. We have tended to do a million little things and left undone the big things that do matter. We have done what seemed necessary and neglected what was essential. Days turn into months, months into years, and our lives become trivialized by distractions. In our scripture today, we see the Apostle Paul addressing the issue of distraction. The context of the scripture is that Paul knows that after Christ's first coming, his second coming could take place at any time. In fact, most people during that time thought that the second coming would come during their lifetimes. So Paul says in verse 29 that the time is short. Paul did not know exactly when Jesus will come again, perhaps not even in his lifetime, but his message to the Corinthians was that since you don't know when Jesus is coming again, you better live uh, your life as if Jesus would come again so that you will be ready. You see, Paul suggested all uh, Christians should therefore sense an urgency to serve the Lord caused by the uncertainty of the time of the end. Paul is well aware that distractions and marriage may temper this urgency. So in his letter to the church at Corinth, Paul uses the example of marriage to teach the church of how to live in a world of distractions without being distractions from the main thing, which is living our lives as authentic, practicing disciples of Christ. And how do we achieve the proper balance of living in this world full of distractions with what should be our priority of focus on what God would have us to do? Well, Paul answers the question of how believers can remain as they are, still living in a world of distraction without being held captive or conformed to the values and structures of the world. In this example of marriage, which Paul uses as a metaphor for life, Paul is saying that we can't get so caught up in pleasing our spouse and in the daily routine life issues that we forget to focus first on our relationship with God, which is paramount to our eternal lives. Paul's goal is to foster proper, constant devotion to the Lord without distraction. Paul is teaching us that there has to be a proper balance in how we spend our time. In other words, don't allow the things of this world, whether they be good or bad, to distract you from focusing on God. Uh, we should certainly love our spouses, and we should certainly love our children and our neighbors as we love ourselves, and we should love them with everything that we've got, but we should not worship them or worship the, uh, the million little things of this world and give them with these or give them or these things all of our time. Worship, beloved, is reserved for God only. God deserves our time and attention before anything else. It's all about our personal and our intimate relationship with God. 
In other words, Paul is saying that the million little things of this world must take a back seat to kingdom priorities, God's priorities. In our lives, there are a million little things that often distract us from having a proper relationship with God. Our jobs can be a distraction. Our, our relationships can be a distraction. Church business can be a distraction. What we perceive as our failures can be a distraction. And what we perceive as our so-called worldly successes can be a distraction. All life experiences and circumstances that take our eyes off of God and as a result, we send us into a downward spiral of confusion, fear, and doubt can be a distraction. How, you may ask, do we escape from this ruthless cycle of being caught up in a million little distractions, distractions to keep us from properly focusing on God and for what God intends for our life to be. Well, let me suggest three things. I got three points for you today. And point number one is this. We must move from pragmatism to passion. We got to move from pragmatism to passion. You see, pragmatism is doing something because it gets results, or it works, or at least it appears that it works in the short run. It's more practical to get your much-needed rest than it is to get up a little earlier and make, make some time for God. It's more practical to make the expected compromises at work rather than to take a firm stand for doing the right thing. It's easier and more practical, young people, to go along with what everybody else is doing, you know, smoking and drinking and drugging and sexing and bullying, than it is to be different and go against the grain and go against the flow, go against the mainstream with a Christ-centered mindset of doing what is right. Or it seems more practical, saints, to meet all the demands of a hectic schedule than it is to eliminate some things that when you really look at it, you could do it without anyone. Oh, pragmatism is doing what works to get you through life with the least resistance, not taking any chances or not taking any risks. It's the safe way out, or so you think. Passion, on the other hand, is the yearning, the craving of a heart that wants to experience the fullness of life no matter what the cost. Pragmatism has small little goals that end in a small little life. But passion, on the other hand, is fire in the belly. It means that your life is defined and directed by godly goals and godly purposes that have, that have engaged your heart and is directing what you do with your life. Passion means something is driving you that has captured your will and set it on fire. With passion, you can't be pushed around and driven by the world of distraction. With passion, you will settle for nothing less than God's best for your life. Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth was a man of passion, beloved. Reverend Shuttlesworth, who died in 2011, was one of the bravest and most dynamic leaders of the modern civil rights movement. He survived bombings, beatings, and dozens of arrests and his efforts to end segregation in Birmingham, Alabama and throughout the South in the 50s and the 60s. Few suffered more on the front lines of the civil rights movement than Reverend Shuttlesworth. He faced down violence from police and racist mobs in Birmingham, which was once called Bombingham. He was beaten so bad by the police led by the infamous Bill Connor that on one occasion he had to be rushed to the hospital in an ambulance. When Bull Connor heard what happened, Bull Connor said, quote, I wish he had been wheeled out in a coffin, end of quote. On Christmas Day in 1956, 56, 15 sticks of dynamite exploded beneath Reverend Shuttleworth's bedroom window. The floor was blown out from under him, but he received only a bump on the head. When recounting this experience to a news magazine years later, he said, quote, I believe I was almost at death's door at least 20 times. But when the first bomb went off, it took all fear from my mind. I knew God was with me like he was with Daniel in the lion's den. 
the black people of Birmingham knew that God had saved me to lead the fight, in the quote. You see, Reverend Shuttlesworth did not allow the distraction of the bombs, the distraction of the police beatings, the distraction of the dogs, or the distraction of the, his mere death experience to distract him from God's calling on his life. Reverend Shuttles was a battle-tested warrior for Christ, had Holy Ghost passion. He had fire in his belly. It's hard to overcome distraction, beloved, if there is no fire in your belly the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives creates passion, a passion for God, a, a passion for righteousness, a, a passion for rightness, and a passion for life. It makes all other passions seem unworthy and undesirable by comparison. When we have that godly passion, we find that we're not just passing through life, but we're grabbing life and holding on for all it's worth. One of the things I, I, I enjoy and love about children so much is their natural enthusiasm and passion for life. But you know, somehow we lose that as we grow older. The cares of the world, the routine of life and the concerns we carry seems to trench the fire. That's why we need to come to the fire every day. In other words, come to God every day to get that fire rekindled. We invite the Holy Spirit into our lives every day to renew and ignite the fire in us again because we don't want to go dragging ourselves to a life of distractions that are keeping our focus away from God. God wants us to be victorious with daily renewed enthusiasm and passion for the things of God kingdom priorities, and for life itself. Amen? And then point number two is that, that you not only need to move from pragmatism to passion, you need to move from being fractured to being focused. You need to move from being fractured to being focused. We're all tempted to be controlled by the tyranny of the urgent. Our lives begin to be controlled by a million little things rather than the one grand controlling thing. If you can begin each day in the Word, you can see the big picture for the day. If you begin each day with prayer and meditation, then you can better focus on what is important. But if you just start your day running, you will never stop running. You have to let the Holy Spirit guide you in creating life goals and ask God for the power to focus on those goals and carry them out each and every day. At times, beloved, we need to stop, look, and just listen to God. We need to take an inventory of our lives and reassess all the things we are doing in our lives and ask ourselves the question, does what I am doing fit into the big picture of who God has called me to be and what God has called me to do? Have I gotten so caught up in the million little distractions of the world that I've lost focus on God's call for my life? For many of us, it could be our jobs. Have we gotten so caught up in a job because of the money, money, money? that it has become a distraction from focusing on God and what God wants for us? We can get caught up in the money and trying to make it to the top, not realizing that the money and career progressions is becoming our focus, is becoming our God. Is that job really what God wants for you? Is it your passion? Oh, I'm so proud of Kate and our 23-year-old nephew who shared with Pastor Sharon and I just this weekend that he just resigned from a high-paying corporate job in New York City to take a position with a sports management firm where he is making substantially less than his corporate position. And he told us that he did it because he realized that sports management was his passion and that he had to be true to himself, his authentic self, and what he felt that God was calling him to do. And that is a 23-year-old, folks. Beloved, you may have to make new priorities and order your life by them in accordance with God's will for your life. Sometimes you got to drop unimportant things 
even if they disappoint some folk, so that you can do the important things, whatever that may be for your life, and only you and God knows what that is. Uh, we got to focus on keeping the main thing the main thing. And what is the main thing? But Jesus is the main thing. And Jesus said, quote, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. If what you're doing is not, or how you are living is not in harmony with the greatest commandment, which is God's priority, then you need to eliminate or minimize the distractions in your life, re-examine and refocus your life. The problem is that oftentimes the main thing is crowded out by a million little things that is not even related to the main thing. You see, when our lives are just fractured, it is any wonder that we are broken. Church, we have to focus on what your life is meant to be according to God's will. God wants us to live, not just exist. There's a difference between living and existing. You only exist when the routine of life pushes you around and determines how you will spend your life. You only exist when you go through each day and never ask what life means or what your purpose is. You see, we just finished reading the book, Don't Cry For Me. And the man who was uh, narrating the book was saying that in, in his the small rural town of Arkansas where he was raised by his, God, his grand, uh, grandfather. The black people in that community just existed. They just tried to get along, to go along and had no other purpose in life except to work for the man. Unhappy, sad, no future in life. They were only existing and not living. You see, you begin to live, however, when you're so focused that you were, you were not settled for merely existing, but live life exceedingly abundantly with passion and joy. Beloved, we must work hard to stay focused instead of being fractured. I got an example for you. Perpetual Roman subject of high standard in the Roman Empire. And Felicity, her slave, were two female Christian martyrs of the third century. These two young women, along with others, were ordered executed by the emperor because of their conversion to Christianity. What set these two women apart from other women saints in the early church was that both were mothers and wives. When Perpetua was thrown into jail, she was nursing an infant, and Felicity was eight months pregnant. In fact, Felicity gave birth two days before the date of her execution. Both of the lives could have been spared if they had renounced Christianity, but neither did. In fact, they both rejoiced as they were led to their death at the hands of the wild beast. Perpetua and Felicity, you see, were not distracted by prison. They were not distracted by their suckling babies. They were not even distracted by the wild beast who were just waiting to tear them from limb from limb. They were focused, not broken, but whole as they presented their lives before God. Focused, not fractured. Point number three and my final point of the day is you need to move from wandering to living your life on purpose. Moving your life from wandering living your life on purpose. Most people today are merely wandering from one day to the next with no eternal goals or purpose. They have never stopped to ask what their purpose is or examine why they are here. The end result is that they live only to please themselves. There's no grand theme or purpose to guide their lives and no plan or how to get there. You may want your life to be different, but if you have no plan on how to get there, most likely nothing good is going to happen. How different it should be for us Christians. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 16, verse 11, quote, you show me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. 
and your right hand are pleasures forevermore. End of quote. Church, we have to come to God and ask God to show us our purpose in life, to despite the distractions and to reveal the path of true life. God will answer and you will experience the resulting joy and pleasure of life as well as God who created it. There is a purpose for your life and it's important to discover that purpose and not let a million little distractions rob you of it. I think of the disciples uh, sleeping in the garden when Jesus needed them to be with him. He had warned them of the importance of prayer. He told them it was the only way they would be delivered in the time of trial and temptation. Yet, they fell asleep. They missed their purpose in those moments. They chose sleep over vigilance. Vigilance. It's no wonder that within a few hours, Peter betrayed his Lord and the rest of them ran away scared. But they should have stood up and stood firm just like Fred Shuttlesworth, just like Perpetua, just like Felicity. In her book, A Practical Guide to Prayer, Dorothy Haskins talks about a noted concert violinist who was asked about the secret of her mastery of the instrument. And she said, quote, there are many things that used to demand my time. When I went to my room after breakfast, I made my bed, straightened my room, dusted, did whatever seemed necessary. When I finished my work, I turned to my violin practice. That system prevented me from accomplishing what I should on the violin. So I re reversed things. I deliberately planned to neglect everything else until my practice period was complete. And that program of planned neglect is the secret of my success. End of quote. Oh, I like the idea of that whole concept of plan neglect. The violinist had a purpose and she put that purpose first and deliberately ne neglected other things that weren't, were not as important and that were distracting her to, from becoming the great violinist that she became. She was a violinist and never forgot it. She was a violinist first and everything else came after that. Pastor Sharon and I saw a story on TV just yesterday about an amputee athlete from Arizona who recently set an unofficial world record, running, uh, running uh, Brother Trey, 102 marathons in 102 days. And you know, a full marathon, y'all, is 26.2 miles, 102 marathons in 102 days. This lady, Jackie Hunt, Rosama, who had never run before her leg was amputated, achieved that goal this past Thursday. Obviously, Jackie had to be, uh, had to have tunnel vision and, and focus to achieve this amazing feat, not permitting anything to get in her way. No distractions. How about you? What is it that God is calling you to focus on? What is your purpose? Can you keep your eyes on the prize in the face of adversity, no matter what? If you hit the hurdles of life, which may cause you to stumble and fall and result in your becoming bloody and bruised, how fast will you get back up and keep running your race? What would happen in your life if you would not check your emails all the, all the time and surf the net until you spent time in, in, in the word? What would happen if you did not turn on the radio or turn on the TV show in the morning until you had time to seek your purpose for the day as you spent time in the presence of God? What would happen if you used the concept of plan neglect and put God's kingdom priorities first before anything else? What if you would not let anything distract you from your main purpose? If you did so, you might not be as fractured you might not be as broken. You might not be in fear. You might not have any. If you focus on God first, making the main thing the main thing, you might just rise up with Holy Ghost power. You might just realize that you don't have to fear any person. You might just realize that you're going to achieve your goals for that day. You might just realize that no distractions, nothing can separate you from the love of God that is Christ Jesus, our Lord. 
And if nothing can separate us or distract us from the love of God, then saints, there's nothing that you cannot do to make a positive, long-lasting, God-inspired impact on this world. Church, there might be momentary and sometimes constant distractions in our lives because that's just the way life is. But even in the midst of those distractions, even in the midst of your lost job, even in the midst of your divorce, um, even in the midst of your bankruptcy, even in the midst of your foreclosure, even in the midst of your sickness, even in the midst of your dire circumstances, even in the midst of social upheaval, even in the midst of your daily experiences, you got to have it in the forefront of your mind that these million little things are only distractions. You got to hurry up and get back to your creator's business, get back to God's calling, get back to God's purpose for your life. In other words, church, get back to the main thing. Can I get an amen? Today is a good day to turn from pragmatism to passion, from being fractured to being focused, and from wandering to living on life on purpose. As Paul pointed out to the church at Corinth, time is of the essence. There is no time to waste. We got to keep it simple so that we can focus on God's vision of love. The time to focus on God is now in everything that we do. And so I'm so glad today that my Jesus was not pragmatic. He didn't try to get through life with the least resistance. Oh, my Jesus was filled with passion when he walked the face of the earth. Everything he did, he did with passion. Uh, he healed with passion. He talked with passion. He walked with passion. He preached with passion. Oh, my Jesus was focused. Nothing got in his way of devoting his entire life to God. No matter how many times the devil tried to tempt him, he kept his eyes fixed on God. No matter how many naysayers crossed his path and tried to trip him up, Jesus kept his eyes fixed on God. No matter how many times his disciples just didn't get it, Jesus kept his eyes fixed on God. Oh, my Jesus lived his life on purpose and for a purpose without distraction. Jesus announced that he had to be about his father's business. You see, Jesus had a plan. Jesus lived his life so that others could follow his example of how to live their lives on fire for God in spite of life's million little distractions. Jesus had a purpose when he walked up Golgotha's hill uh, with that old rugged cross hanging over his back. Jesus had a purpose when they nailed him to the cross with the blood streaming down his body. Jesus had a purpose when he said, God, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. But Jesus had a purpose when he bowed his head and he died, even with the distraction of death. And that's what it was, church, only a minor distraction for Jesus. Jesus had a purpose when three days later, he got up, rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven for our sins, so that we can have a brand new life despite the million little distractions. A life filled with passion, a life filled with focus, and a life filled with purpose. Let the church say amen, amen, and amen. Pastor Guy, you knocked that one out the box. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let's give him a hand clap of praise. Amen. 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 That it was a marvelous, marvelous sermon. I mean, caught up in distractions, a million little things. Point one, move from pragmatism to passion. Point two, move from fracture to focus. And last but not least, move from wandering to living with a sense of purpose. Amen. That was a powerful pastor, you guys. You can't see the chat, but lots and lots of 
of comments and high fives in the chat. I love sometimes you drop you need to drop the unimportant stuff. Even if you disappoint other people who have expectations for you, live with your own dream. I told a young lady last week and I was in New York, I said, do not let someone else dictate your narrative. Amen. In other words, your dream is for you and people don't, you don't need people to agree with your dream for it to be your dream. <laughs> Amen. And so I love that. Pastor God, thank you so much for that powerful sermon. And you see, he uh, borrowed a little bit from the halls of sermons. Keep the main thing, the main thing. Amen. It's all good to borrow from each other. Amen. Amen. And so we really want to thank Pastor Guy again for that wonderful thing, uh, preaching, uh, hour. And I love that he said Jesus didn't let death distract him from his purpose. Amen. So let's give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. We're now going to our... Uh, Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> We're now going to our communion service. Well, before we do that, we need to do the invitation. Amen. <clears throat> so here we go. It took me a second, y'all. So our invitation, we always have two invitations each week. The first one is if you do not know. Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, if you do not realize that you have a best friend, that you do not realize that you don't need to be caught up in distractions with million little things, because if you keep the main thing, the main thing, then that is having a relationship, an authentic relationship, not a fake relationship, not a superficial relationship, right? Because if you're going to do that, you might as well not have a relationship. Jesus wants to be your all in all. Jesus wants to be your heart. Jesus wants to be your lover, your lover of your soul. So if you want that kind of relationship, an authentic relationship with Jesus, we invite you today to allow him into your heart. Is this a formal thing you have to do? No. That we need proof that you did it? No, because it's a personal relationship between you and Jesus. Amen. And so we invite you to do that. And the second petition is if you do not have a church home and you've been looking, you don't have to look any further. We welcome you into the beloved community church. You, how do you let us know that? You can send us an email at belovedcommunitychurch at yahoo.com. You can also text us at our cell phone number at 240-899-7511. You can also call us or text us. You can also put it in the chat today. We are not a perfect church. We're not a church without spot or wrinkle. What we do really well is we love like Jesus loves, amen. We accept you for who you are, just as you are. And we, if you see them on the slide, God's doors are open to everyone, amen. And so we are an open and affirming church to believe that all of God's children are not just loved, but are extravagantly loved, amen, and are adored. And so if you want to belong to a church like that, we invite you to join us. Let us know. And you don't have to let us know today. Maybe you need to think about it a little bit more. You can let us know during the week. Amen. Because we have that cell phone and that email 24-7. <laughs> so you don't have to let us know today. So we hope that you enjoy part of this, all the, some part of the service, all the service. And we want to just remind you again, if you came in late, you still have the opportunity to give, which is also a form of worship. You can go to our website, www.belovedcommunitychurchmd.org slash giving. Click on the giving icon. It'll take you to your, you can use your credit card or you can also use PayPal. Most of us love PayPal because once you populate it once, it's automatic. You go to PayPal directly and put in belovedcommunity.church at yahoo.com and thereafter it will always be populated. Or you can do it the old fashioned way and send us a check, not cash, but a check or money order to Beloved Community Church, P.O. Box 441-439. Fort Washington, Maryland, 20749. Amen. We're now time for our communion service. So hopefully everyone has gone to get their bread, crackers, and their juice or wine. I'm going to ask if Reverend Dr. Deb, if you can do the prayer of confession. Is that okay? Good, thank you. And then I will do the um, prayer of adoration. And Pastor Guy is up here with me now, but we're going to give him a rest because he's <laughs> preached his heart out. Amen. Excellent sermon, baby. Amen. I had to get my, got to get my honey that little kiss before we move on. Amen. Dr. Debbie, you can do the prayer of confession. 
Almighty God, creator of all things, we acknowledge that we have often fallen short of your glory and that we have offended you with our many sins, be they by commission or omission, through thought, word, or deed. We do sincerely repent and are truly sorry for our sins, just remembering the many ways that we have offended you and broken your heart fills us with grief. Have mercy on us, O God, for our Redeemer and Savior, Jesus Christ's sake. Please give us another opportunity to serve and please you with our whole hearts, our whole minds, our whole spirit, so that in doing so, we might bring glory and honor to your most holy name. Have mercy on me, O oh God, according, according to your steadfast love, love according, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence, and blameless when you pass judgment. O create in me a clean heart, O God and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain to me a willing spirit. Because you are the heavenly architect of our faith, the ever-present, all-knowing, all-powerful God. Because you are El Shaddai, the one who is more than enough. Because you are Elohim, the eternal creator and sustainer who both initiates and keeps a covenant with us because you are able to look beyond our flaws and see our possibilities because you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider, the one who always supplies all of our needs according to your riches and glory. And because you are Jehovah Shalom, the one who gives us a peace that transcends our circumstances, we cannot help but give you all the praise, all the honor and all the glory of oh God together. Oh, oh God, God, you are, are my God. God. I, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. And as a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. Almighty God, who because of your tender mercies did make a perfect, full, and complete sacrifice by offering up your only begotten son for the remission of our sins. Jesus, our savior and redeemer, instituted this sacrament, holy communion, and remembrance of his death and passion so that we might be partakers of his body and his blood. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, said the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You can take up the bread. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You may drink from the cup. Well, as often as you uh, eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves, and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Amen. Communion was served. That ends our service for today. We hope that you were blessed by something that was done or said, or even in your spirit um, by the service today. We want to thank everyone who participated in the service. Next week is Mother's Day, and then we'll be blessed by the preaching of our very own Reverend Carl Taylor Sr. 
The following week will be yours truly, and then it will be our anniversary. Our anniversary is only three weeks away, y'all. So let's make sure we share that announcement, share it on your Facebook page, share it in an email, share it any kind of way you can. How can you share it? Go to our website or go to our Facebook page. You can click on it, download the flyer, and I also will send it out in an email today so you can send it out that way. But make sure we have a full house on May 22nd. Amen. Amen. And now for our benediction. May we go forward to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Let us covenant not to take easy answers or succumb to apathy, but to seek God's will in all that we do. Let us follow Christ's lead in redirecting our gaze to God's economy and commit to distributive justice so that all may have abundance, freedom, and peace, remembering that we are citizens that belong to Jesus Christ's reign. May the peace of God, the love of Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with you now and forever. Amen. 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 We hope that everybody in Facebook <clears throat> land has a blessed week. Amen. And don't forget God loves you.